Welcome back, Follow Mass. This video will be a journey through the evolution of the atom, from early proposed ideas to where we are now. We will tour atomic history, stopping at and simplifying landmarks along the way, providing examples of how these atoms were held together to give an intuitive understanding of how we thought the world was structured. Our lesson begins, as many do, with the ancient Greeks, and a simple question. If you kept dividing an object indefinitely, what would be the result? In 5th century BCE, two philosophers, Leucippus the teacher and Democritus his pupil, proposed the idea of the atomos, Greek for indivisible. The common consensus attributes the origin of the atom to Democritus. However, he mainly refined and elaborated on the ideas of his master. Their agreed upon properties of the atomos were that these were the fundamental building blocks that, once coming together, made up reality as we know it. Like pixels to a digital screen, the image emerges from its constituent parts. While this may seem eerily correct for his time, Democritus had a difficult time pitching his ideas to his peers, mainly because there was a much bigger figure who had a conflicting theory, and you may have heard of him. That would be Aristotle who may have had some revolutionary and endearing propositions of his own, but he wasn't perfect, especially in this case. Aristotle was a celebrity of his time, and his theories long outlived him. That's why when he stated that instead of unique atoms making up the world, that there were four basic elements of earth, wind, water, and fire, people took his side because of his mix of popularity and how intuitive his idea seemed. It's far easier to visualize mixtures of his four elements that could be divided infinitely than Democritus' minuscule, finitely sized atoms within a void that took different arrangements, sizes, and shapes to make everything we know. He would elaborate that his particles constantly moved around, and upon clumping together due to their surface shapes, for example, sweet substances had smooth surfaces and bitter substances had spikes, would form ourselves and everything we see. Yet no matter how hard Democritus tried, he would be mainly forgotten in the annals of history until John Dalton resurrected his concepts in his 1808 book, A New System of Chemical Philosophy. Dalton worked from a chemistry perspective, building upon Lavoisier's Law of Conservation of Mass and Law of Constant Composition the former stating that matter cannot be created or destroyed in chemical reactions, and the latter stating that all samples of a particular compound will be made up of the same elements and the same proportion or ratio. An example being that water will always have two hydrogen and one oxygen molecule, a two to one ratio. Dalton specified that atoms of different elements vary in mass and size, and that atoms are indestructible so that they can be rearranged but never created or destroyed. His proof for this was found in an experiment with water, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. Water absorbed the CO2 better than it did nitrogen, and he suspected this was because of a difference in mass and shape. Sure enough, CO2 is a heavier compound when compared to nitrogen. Dalton was the first to provide some evidence for his atomic theories, a significant leap forward in our understanding but as with much of science, his proposals weren't accepted in his time and for most of the 1800s. That was until J.J. Thompson discovered the electron in 1897. In his time, electricity was beginning to be used widely, but no one really understood the inner workings of how it functioned. Thompson undertook the challenge of finding out with a cathode ray tube that shoots electricity from the bottom of a glass tube to its top. Some thought that the rays emitted were waves, while others suspected particles. Upon having electric and magnetic fields surround the tube, Thompson himself witnessed the cathode rays bending to one side, just as a stream of charged particles would. Through later experimentation with positively charged particles and gases, he created the plum pudding model of the atom in 1904, one in which there were small negatively charged electrons distributed within a solid, positively charged mass. This is the moment that the first subatomic particle was discovered, the electron. 
Progress from this point onward happened astronomically fast, with our next breakthrough being only five years later in 1909. This is the year Ernest Rutherford, a former student of Thomson, discovered the positive nucleus and protons from his gold foil experiment. He shot alpha particles, which he would soon find out were just helium nuclei, at a thin sheet of gold foil surrounded by detectors. Most of his alpha particles shot straight through, but there were some that deflected in other directions, and even some that somehow shot back towards the particle emitter. The only thing with that much repulsive force could be an equally dense and large positive substance at the center of each atom. He had not only discovered the nucleus, but that atoms were mostly empty space. By 1911, he developed his nuclear model, which featured negative electrons that orbited a positive nucleus like planets around the sun. This was their idea of the electrostatic force and the last classical atomic interpretation. Only two years later, in 1913, Niels Bohr would introduce newer quantum mechanical elements into his atomic model. His is the most commonly seen orbit model, which mainly corrected the idea about electrons in their orbits. He observed that electrons must stay in a defined energy state, which is placed at specific distances from the nucleus. Electrons jump between these states upon absorbing or emitting energy through photons, for example. Evidence for these specific orbits was found by James Frank and Gustav Hertz in 1914. Upon emitting a photon and losing energy, the electron will jump to a lower energy state and vice versa. He discovered this by measuring the light energy emitted from hydrogen atoms, which came through certain wavelengths each time. This model works perfectly fine for simple explanations, it's just not entirely accurate. The final model is the quantum mechanical model developed over the 1920s by Erwin Schrödinger and Werner Heisenberg, featuring orbitals, not orbits in which the electrons orbit like planets. In orbitals, electrons are buzzing around in an area of possible locations. It ends up being a spherical teardrop-shaped location of possibilities where the electron could potentially be. The final shape of possibilities is like taking an image of a time lapse of electron movement. Heisenberg also introduced his uncertainty principle, which asserted that if you were to attempt to pinpoint the location of an electron within its orbital, it would be impossible, as you cannot measure its position and momentum simultaneously. Meaning that as the uncertainty of one variable decreases towards zero, the other increases accordingly. For the last subatomic particle, James Chadwick discovered neutrons in 1932. Up till this point, atoms were known to have different atomic and mass numbers. For example, helium has an atomic number of 2, but a mass number of 4. For a while, it was speculated that there were more protons present, which had their charges cancelled by electrons in the nucleus. But this theory didn't hold up with experimental evidence. He conducted experiments where he fired alpha particles at beryllium. The resulting radiation was suspected to be high-energy gamma rays, a form of light. However, this radiation also knocked loose protons in a paraffin wax target, something highly unlikely for a massless photon to do. Thus, the neutron, with a similar mass to the proton, was discovered. This brought forward the foundation for uncovering isotopes atoms with the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons. That would become vital to the effort of producing atomic fission, where man would finally split the unsplittable atom. Upon Rutherford discovering the nucleus, it was only a matter of time before humanity would split the unsplittable. In fact, it happened far earlier than most people know. Way back in 1917, Rutherford fired alpha particles at a nitrogen atom, causing individual protons to be knocked out of the nucleus. In 1934, it was men like Enrico Fermi who began bombarding uranium atoms with neutrons because they wouldn't be altered by charges within the target atom. Debate existed over whether the resulting lighter particles that resulted from splitting uranium were elements known or new transuranic ones, but eventually it was decided 
they were split into the same elements we know and love, along with some extra energy due to Einstein's mass-energy equivalence, thus leading to the concept of nuclear reactors and weapons. In terms of where atomic science stands today, the Heisenberg model is still given credence for its accuracy. However, we have also discovered what lies within the subatomic particles that we've elaborated on, those being gluons and quarks. But that's for another day. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it and related topics, please leave a like, subscribe, and comment what you've learned, what we should cover next, and if we've made any mistakes. Have a good day, Philomaths, and don't forget to feed your passion of learning.